Close Source is brought to you with support from the following sustainable brands. Selena Sanders, a social impact brand that specializes in upcycle clothing using only reclaimed vintage or thrifted materials from tea towels, linens, blankets, and quilts. Sustainably crafted in Los Angeles, each piece is designed to last in one's closet for generations to come. Maximum style, minimal carbon footprint. Picnic wear, a slow fashion brand made by hand in New York City from vintage and dead stock textiles. Picnic wear strives for minimal waste, but maximum authenticity. Future vintage over future garbage. Find Picnic Wear on Instagram at Picnic Wear, and that's wear, W-E-A-R, and at www.picnicwear.com. No Flight Back Vintage, bringing fun new life to old things. Always using recycled and secondhand materials to make dope-ass shit for dope-ass people. See more on Instagram at No Flight Back Vintage. Shift clothing out of beautiful Astoria, Oregon, with a focus on natural fibers, simple hardworking designs, and putting fat people first. Discover more at shiftwheeler.com. Late to the party, creating one-of-a-kind statement clothing from vintage, salvaged, and thrifted textiles. They hope to tap into the dreamy memories we all hold. Floral curtains, a childhood dress, the wallpaper in your best friend's rec room all while creating modern, sustainable garments that you'll love wearing and have for years to come. Late to the Party is passionate about celebrating and preserving textiles, the memories they hold, and the stories they have yet to tell. Check them out on Instagram at Late to the Party People. Vino Vintage, based just outside of LA. We love the hunt of shopping secondhand because you never know what you might find. Catch us at flea markets around Southern California by following us on Instagram at vino.vintage so you don't miss our next event. Shop Journal Vintage, specializing in upcycled, handmade, and vintage fashion for all genders. Owner Laura makes each piece by hand with love in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. With an emphasis on upcycled menswear, tie-dye, modern jewelry, cottagecore collars, and everything in between, Shop Journal makes pieces they love and hopes you will too. Getting dressed should always be fun. See more on Instagram at shop underscore journal. Old Flame Mending helps you keep your clothes intact through clothing repair, visible mending, and tailoring. Through extending the life of textiles, Old Flame Mending makes your pieces not only wearable and functional again, but also unique and beautiful. This mending duo is based in Pittsburgh, but they take mail-in mending orders from anywhere in the U.S. For more information, visit them at oldflamemending.com or follow them on Instagram at Old Flame Mending. Gabriella Antonis is a visual artist and an ethical trade fashion designer, but Gabriella is also a radical feminist micro business. She's the one woman band trying to help you understand why slow fashion is what the earth needs. The one woman band to help you build your own brand. She can take your fashion line from just a concept and do your sketches, pattern making, grading, sourcing, cutting, and sewing. The second option is for those who aren't trying to start a business and who just want ethical garments. Gabriella Antonis will create custom made-to-measure garments just for you. Her goal is to help one person of any size at a time, including beyond size 40. To inquire about this serendipitous intersectional offering of either concept, DM her on Instagram to book a consultation. Please follow her on Instagram and Twitter at Gabriella Antonis. Dylan Page is an online clothing and lifestyle brand based out of St. Louis, Missouri. Our products are chosen with intention for the conscious community. Everything we carry is animal-friendly, ethically made, sustainably sourced, and cruelty-free. Dylan Page is for those who never stop questioning where something comes from. We know that personal experience dictates what's sustainable for you, and we are here to help guide and support you to make choices that fit your needs. Check us out at dylanpage.com and find us on Instagram at dylanpagelifeandstyle. Salt Hats, purveyors of truly sustainable hats, hand-blocked, sewn, and embellished in Detroit, Michigan. Find us on Instagram at Salt Hats. Wide-Eyed Vintage, a curator of truly covetable vintage from Minneapolis, Minnesota. Wide-Eyed Vintage encourages the experimental spirit of dressing up and will provide you with all the special pieces that will make your wardrobe truly unique. 
Dedicated to preserving the craftsmanship of clothes, Wide-Eyed Vintage only selects pieces that are well-made, pieces that have been proven to last beyond their lifetimes, so you too can enjoy them for more lifetimes to come. See more on Instagram at wide underscore eyed underscore vintage. Karen Kinney Studio. Located in Western Massachusetts, Karen specializes in handcrafted earrings from found, upcycled, and repurposed fabrics, as well as other eco-friendly curios, all with a hint of nostalgia, a dollop of whimsy, a dash of color, and 100% fun. Karen is an artist slash designer who believes the materials we use matter. See more on Instagram at Karen Kinney Studio or online at www.cKinney.com. Gentle Vibes Vintage. We are purveyors of polyester and psychedelic relics. We encourage experimentation and play not only in your wardrobe, but in your home too. We have thousands of killer vintage pieces ready for their next adventure. See them all on Instagram at Gentle Vibes Vintage. Thumbprint is Detroit's only fair trade marketplace located in the historic Eastern Market. Our small business specializes in products handmade by empowered women in South Africa, making a living wage, creating things they love like hand-painted candles and ceramics. We also carry a curated assortment of sustainable and natural locally made goods. Thumbprint is a great gift destination for both the special people in your life and for yourself. Browse our online store at thumbprintdetroit.com and find us on Instagram at thumbprintdetroit. St. Evans is a New York City-based vintage retailer that is dedicated to bringing you those special vintage pieces you'll reach for again and again. More than just an online store, St. Evans is dedicated to sharing the stories and history behind the garments. 20% of all sales are donated to a new charitable organization each month, amplifying and supporting causes like food insecurity, racial justice, homelessness, and LGBTQ plus support. For the month of February, St. Evans is supporting Canal Cafeteria, a nonprofit that provides sliding scale fresh produce bags to the Lower East Side neighborhood of New York City. Your vintage purchase from St. Evans supports a small, women of color run business while giving back to the collective community we're all a part of. New Vintage is released every Thursday at 12 p.m. Eastern Time at wearsaintevens.com with previews of new pieces and more brought to you on Instagram at where underscore st dot evens. That's at where Saint Evans. Shop Vintage, do good, and wear Saint Evans. Welcome to Close Force, the podcast that does occasionally give you a geography lesson. I'm your host, Amanda. Welcome to episode 56. Today, we'll be continuing our exploration of all things secondhand. You know, I'm actually kind of sad that secondhand month is almost over, but you know, we'll never stop talking about it. I mean, we're still talking about trash. We're going to talk about trash today even. And trash month feels like, thanks to the way COVID has totally destroyed my perception of time, trash month feels like it was about 100 years ago (laughs) and not just a month ago. On Wednesday, I will reveal March's theme because it's really important that I hear from all of you to, I don't know, let March achieve its full potential here on Close Horse. So what are we doing today? Well, we have four, that's one, two, three, four hotline calls. Is that a record? I'm not really sure. And all of these calls are so good. Originally, I was going to cut some of them out and save them for the next episode, but they were just all too good. So 
If you're thinking about calling the hotline, please do, because otherwise I might not have any calls for episode 57. After we take some calls today, we'll get into a conversation with Sophie of Ooey Gooey Van Shop. She has quite a story to tell, and I think it will inspire you to chase down the things that make you happy. While you're here, I'll just remind you, if you're interested in supporting my work on Clothes Horse via Patreon, you can find out more at patreon.com slash clothes horse podcast. You can also send a direct donation via Venmo to at crystal underscore visions. Elena did that this week, and thank you so much, Elena. And now I'm halfway to being able to afford a scanner for clotheshorse.world. I never thought I'd be needing to buy a scanner, but... It will allow us to scan my library of vintage books so we have cool images for blog posts and we'll be able to scan the drawings by illustrators and you know other visual artists when necessary. Uh, right now we're relying on phone photos of art. So uh, we're gonna work on getting a scanner so we can really, really bring you all the hot images on clotheshorse.world. So thank you so much, Alina, for helping me make some progress towards getting one. And All of your support from all of you allows me to hopefully someday make Clothes Horse my real actual paying job. You make my dream feel so much closer. So thank you so much. Before we plug in the Hello Kitty phone and start answering some calls, I want to talk to you a little bit about what happens to our discarded clothing. We talked about this in the last episode, so I'm going to review some stuff that I talked about then. First, I told you that only 15% of our unwanted clothing is donated, which it is just a staggeringly depressing number on its own. I also told you that less than half of those donated clothes are ever worn by another person, primarily because the demand for secondhand clothing comes nowhere near the volume of clothing that we're donating which is of course extra frustrating when you remember that only 15% of our discarded clothes are heading to thrift stores in the first place. I mean, we're just, we're buying way more than anyone could ever keep up with, you know? Only 3% of our clothes are reworn in our community, which when I say community, that can mean your town, but it could also mean your state. It could mean kind of like your region of the country. It kind of just depends who you donated it to and how they sort of distribute donations. The remaining clothes, and it's a lot of them, they are sent off to massive for-profit textile recycling companies. And I also mentioned in the last episode that these recycling companies, they are making mad money. Like this is big business because... We buy so many clothes and get sick of them so fast. The recycling companies take the clothing, they take epic amounts of it, and they sort it all out. A majority of these clothes are sent off for shredding and grinding where they'll be made into other products. That's what's called downcycling. Here is when about 4% of our discarded clothing is finally worn by another person, but in order for that to happen, It has to be bailed up and shipped overseas. A lot of this clothing ends up in different secondhand clothing markets around the world, particularly in Africa, where some of it is resold, but most of it is not. You're probably asking yourself, why is most of it not resold? And, you know, your sub question there, if you will, maybe it's your follow-up question. If most of it's not being sold, why is it being shipped overseas in the first place? Excellent questions. (laughs) We'll get into it. Most of this is never worn again because it is low quality fast fashion. And it's a lot of like one-off tees for office 5Ks and bachelorette parties. You know, you know what I'm talking about. There's a lot of Halloween costumes in there. Nobody wants this stuff. I would say if you don't want it, probably no one else wants it either. Does it fit weird? Have a busted zipper? Is it a weird color or strangely see-through or itchy? Does the color transfer onto your body every time you wear it? Is half the embellishment, like the beading and sequins, missing after one or two wears? No one wants this, including people in the secondhand markets around the world. People want nice clothes. They want to feel good when they get dressed. 
These are like uniform human characteristics. And when we assume that somehow things are, quote, so different in other countries that the citizens don't care how terrible their clothing is, well, that's just racism. (laughs) It's time to dismantle that thinking. There's this certain element of donating your clothing that makes you feel like, I don't know, this is going to be a strong wording here, but we think when we donate our clothing that we're somehow absolving the sin of overconsumption, of buying a huge bag of stuff just because it was a hot deal, but never actually wearing it, of buying things that can only be worn once because they're pretty foolish, of buying into trends that were never right for us in the first place, of just, you know, buying whatever we want, whenever we want. And that's just not how it works. I mean, you know, you've heard me say before, there's no fabric that allows us to buy all the clothes we want and then throw them away. And it's the same thing with donation. Donation doesn't delete overconsumption and it's not a cure for it. It's sort of like when we no longer see our clothing, we feel like it never happened and we have to stop thinking that way. So much like the U.S., really just about any Western country, the U.K. loves fast fashion. It's way into overconsuming clothes, you know, buying them at a rapid clip, barely wearing them, and then disposing of them. And just like in the U.S., most of the U.K.'s unwanted clothing goes to landfills. A small percentage of it is sold at thrift shops all across the country, just like here in the U.S., an equivalent amount ships overseas. And a lot of the unwanted clothing from the UK specifically ends up in Ghana. You probably know Ghana is in Africa, but let's just have a really quick geography lesson. So Ghana is located in Western Africa. That puts it on the side of Africa that sort of faces North America. It's on the Atlantic Ocean and its capital is Accra. On the outskirts of this capital city is a 30-foot mountain of what? Is it a mountain of pizza, of kittens, of good vibes? No, it is a mountain of rotting, discarded clothing. And yes, this mountain is 30 feet tall. Now, I was like, okay, I don't know what that really means. Like, what does 30 feet look like to me? Well, I did, I did some, you know, Googling around. That's slightly taller than a two-story building. So like the house I live in has two floors. Okay, so this is a mountain that's even taller than that of discarded clothing. Now, Accra has been the home of a flourishing secondhand clothing market for more than 50 years. But fashion and our buying habits have changed a lot in that half of a century. So while Ghana once received a pretty manageable stream of high quality, very useful clothing, now it receives an excessive amount of low quality, frequently unwearable, fast fashion. This flood of essentially other people's garbage has taxed the country's infrastructure to a point where managing the disposal of these unwearable clothes is virtually impossible. Hence the mountain of rotting clothes. And some of these landfills are already full and are closed to any more clothes ever being added. And these clothes have just sort of found their way to littering all the streets of the city, especially near the landfills and near the used clothing market. Kanta Manto is the clothing market in Accra. And every week around 15 million items of clothing arrive at Cantamanto via the Ghanaian port of Tema. And most of these clothes are coming directly from the UK. One of the entrances to Cantamanto still bears the words, and I'm going to totally blow this one because I could not find a pronunciation for it. It bears the words Obroni Wawu, an Akin phrase meaning dead white man's clothes. 
At the time the market was built in the 1960s, no one could believe that someone who was still living on this earth would ever part with the clothing that flowed into the market because it was just so nice. They assumed that all of the previous owners had passed away because why would they ever part with such lovely clothing? Of course, it's completely different now, and nobody thinks that. The Cantamento market is filled with individual stalls, and within those stalls, sellers, you know, sell the secondhand clothing. The sellers buy bales, massive bales, and they don't know what will be inside of them. I have heard rumors that the clothes on the outside are always way nicer than the clothes inside and really don't indicate at all the quality of what you're going to find. These sellers have been known to say a prayer before they open a bale because, you know, often they're really disappointed. The quality of the clothing inside is usually just so terrible that even the best seamstresses cannot make the garment saleable. And it's not just a rumor or a suspicion that these clothes are fast fashion. Journalists and activists alike that have visited the mountain of clothing outside Accra have seen the labels on these clothes. They see a ton of H&M, Topshop, Boohoo, Forever 21, all the fast fashion brands sold in the UK. And I'm just going to remind you something we talk about all the time on the show. We've reached a point where most clothing is fast fashion, especially if you buy it from a mass market brand. So you don't even need to see the labels to assume that the majority of this clothing would be low quality fast fashion, because that is just where we are right now. Around 40% of the used clothes that are imported into the country ends up rotting in landfills. And remember, we said that 15 million items of clothing arrive each week. Well, that would mean 6 million items of clothing would end up in a landfill probably the next week. That's more than 300 million garments per year heading from somewhere overseas to Ghana and off to the landfill. When I do that math, I say, how Is the mountain of clothing only 30 feet tall? And when do we expect it to reach 50 or 100? Because it would seem that that time is not that far off, right? More than 50 tons a day of these clothes are being hauled over to the landfill. 50 tons a day, okay? Many items are being dumped on wasteland and beaches I've seen some terrifying photos of piles of clothing kind of liquefying into one mass on a beach in Ghana. It's chilling. Of course, then these garments, if they're on the beach, they find their way into the ocean. Remember, most of these clothes are synthetic. In fact, more than two-thirds of clothing sold in the last year alone is made of synthetic materials, which, as you know, means they are plastics, which means of course, that they are shedding microplastics into the ocean, the soil, the air, you name it. It's not a pretty situation. But hey, all of us in the Western world, we don't even have to see it. It's like out of sight, out of mind. We're all like Marie condoing our closet and we never have to deal with the repercussions of it. As these clothes break down, either in landfills or just out in the open, in the street, on the beach, out in a vacant lot, they form a poisonous clothing soup, which releases toxins into the environment as the fibers break down. Because remember, these are synthetic fibers. They're made with petrochemicals. Liz Ricketts is the co-founder of the OR Foundation, a nonprofit organization researching the environmental, social, and economic impact of the secondhand clothing trade in Accra. She says, quote, the textile mountain is an environmental catastrophe. Too much clothing is being manufactured because of fast fashion, and a lot of it is made for a second life. Traders constantly reference the fabric as not being of good quality. They can't sell it, and so it ends up being thrown away. I'm just going to take a moment here and talk about fast fashion. 
Well, I mean, I guess I've been talking about fast fashion the whole time, but specifically what we say and what we think about fast fashion as secondhand clothing. And I think it's this. I often hear a lot of people talking about vintage and I hear a lot of people talking about secondhand luxury and maybe even specific brands that are kind of have like a cult following, you know, like Lazy Oaf or Big Bud Press. I don't hear people talking about their love of secondhand Gap or secondhand Old Navy or even secondhand Madewell, right? Our community needs to reset our view of secondhand clothing. Yes, I know we all wear tons of secondhand. I have a whole closet full of vintage upstairs. But we need to, much like Jennifer said in the last episode, we need to look at the racks in the thrift store and we need to look at the stuff that sits between the vintage and the luxury because that's the majority of what's there. And yes, that clothing is most likely fast fashion because as I just said a couple of minutes ago, almost all clothing has become fast fashion. And we need to value those clothes too. They're not disposable. We need to mend them. We need to make them last. We need to buy them and wear them again. We can't just ignore them in favor of like brands we feel are desirable or vintage. We need to actually give all of those clothes a second life. And I think that often buying secondhand fast fashion is is stigmatized, which is very classist because the truth is all of us have bought brand new fast fashion in our lives. Why would we turn up our nose on it in the thrift store? It's like we're saying, oh, that clothing is disposable and we need to reset that thinking because it's not. Once again, this clothing is going overseas and just breaking down into like a toxic soup. That's disgusting and wrong. And so I can't say enough that like as often as possible, you need to be buying secondhand clothing and you need to not have those blinders on that screen out fast fashion. So, okay, back to Ghana. So Liz Ricketts, who I just mentioned, she was in Ghana in August of 2019 when the methane released by the rotting clothes in one of the textile landfills caused an explosion. And you know what? That landfill is still burning to this day. This landfill that is solely textiles, it's fueled by smoldering clothing and additional methane released as the clothes break down. And it's important to remember that we don't actually know what fully happens when mountains of synthetic clothing break down because even the oldest synthetics have only been around since like the 1950s. And at that point, they were significantly less common than now. In fact, you probably think of the 70s as the golden era of polyester. I know I did. Well, you would be wrong because apparently right now is the golden era of polyester. Production of polyester has increased nine times since the 1970s, partially because we buy about five times more clothing than we did back then, but also because more and more clothing is made of poly because it's cheap. And because we have shown as customers, especially since the recession, that we don't care if our clothes are synthetic. We care. We need to let the brands know that, right? Ricketts goes on to say, quote, to view the secondhand clothing trade in Ghana as an optimal outlet for reuse is simply misinformed. The reality is that the global North is relying on Ghana and other nations to take part in a waste management strategy necessitated by relentless overproduction and overconsumption. And she's right. We're outsourcing our problems. We're buying a whole suitcase of brand new clothes from Fashion Nova to go on vacation, bring them home, jamming them in the back of the closet, and a couple months later, Marie condoing because it was snowed in or something, and sending it all off to the Goodwill. We are buying so many clothes that no one could ever rewear them all, and we're not even able to wear them all. On top of that, we're continuing to fuel these businesses that feel like it's totally okay 
to sell us shitty polyester clothing. We're treating clothing like it's actually disposable, which it is all caps, definitely not. It's not a Kleenex. It's not a cotton swab. Clothing is not disposable. You know, I had this aha moment this week. I was just thinking about all of this. And I realized that of all the clothing I'd bought in the last 10 years was here in my house with me, I would probably have to commandeer an entire bedroom to store it. And it would be uncomfortable. It would be shameful if company came over. I mean, in a world where you can have people over to your house, right? If people came over to my house and accidentally wandered into that room that was just filled with all of this clothing, I would be so embarrassed. If we were looking at all the clothing I'd bought in the last 20 years, that'd probably be two rooms or more. I mean, especially if we threw shoes and belts and dollar ninety jewelry from Forever 21 in there and random bags and I mean, I don't even know what else. It's shameful to take a moment and think about that, to envision the volume because the reality is I can't remember all the clothes that have come in and out of my life. And I'm sure you can't either because there's been way too many. We're often not confronted by our overconsumption because we can clean out our closets and then just like dump it off at the Goodwill or sell it at Buffalo Exchange or just, God forbid, throw it in the trash. Well, apparently we're doing that with 85% of our old clothes anyway. Old being the incorrect adjective there. They really should be unwanted. I've actually been like training myself to never say old clothes and always say unwanted because that's really the case. It's not that they're old, right? Because then they'd be vintage. We have to change our ways. We have to shift to a secondhand first mentality. We have to stop throwing our stuff in the trash. Please stop doing that. We have to donate it. We have to give it to our friends. We have to share it in buy nothing groups. I think when we have more responsibility over our consumption, when we are confronted with it and have to do the work to rehome it, it makes us think twice when we're about to buy something random because it's a hot deal. Right now, being able to just send our clothes to another continent, a continent we probably will never visit unless we're really lucky, and we certainly won't ever get to go see the mountain of all of our unwanted clothing, sending it away, this out of sight, out of mind, it's really dangerous for us. It allows us to never really think too hard about our consumption. We also need to preach the gospel of secondhand first and not throwing our stuff in the trash to everyone who will listen. Spread the word and change some minds. Like those are your marching orders for this episode. And what about the companies that make these clothes? We need to hold them accountable for what happens to a garment at the end of its life. I promise you, if H&M or Forever 21 were personally responsible for what happened to every garment that they sold us with like a shoddy, soon-to-be-broken zipper, we would see them making clothes that were going to last a lot longer than a few wears. They would not want to have to deal with the expense of sort of rehabilitating our cast-offs. Making this happen, of course, is going to require laws, but it's already happening in France. So I believe we can make this a global policy. We can change the trajectory of this environmental disaster that is fast fashion, not just for us, not just for our kids, but for people who live on other continents in poorer countries who are being forced to live with our waste. Well, deep breath. Now that I've lectured you, let's take some calls. (laughs) First up is a message from Lydia of Country Feedback Vintage and Vinyl. You might recognize her name because she has a recurring column at clotheshorse.world called Parent Trash. Lydia has a horror story about a stain, but I promise it has a happy ending. Hi, Amanda. This is Lydia from Country Feedback, and I am calling because I am so excited about Secondhand Month. Um, The shop that we have, which is Country Feedback, is a vintage and record shop 
in Tarboro, North Carolina, and we sell primarily secondhand items. So I am in the business of secondhand, and I'm also a lifelong thrifter and vintage enthusiast. Um, I just love listening to all of the episodes so far this month, and I also wanted to take note of a very great episode that you put out earlier, um, episode 39 with Jenny, the estate sale queen. Um, I totally related to her because part of my love for vintage and thrifting is imagining who owned this and what was their life like. And, you know, there's a reverence there that I value as part of our business when someone brings us a special collection from, you know, a loved one, I really go through it and I look at each piece and I, you know, I touch the garments and I look at the belongings and you can really get a picture of someone's life. Um, there's this whole aspect of, of that, that I just love. So, um, Jenny, the estate sale queen, you are a queen. And, um, that brings me to the reason that I'm calling is based on your, I believe it was the first secondhand month episode where you asked if anyone had any tips on crotch stain removals. So let me segue into my hot tip for crotch stain removals, but it is wrapped in a bit of a saga. Okay. The tip is this product called retro clean. Um, I researched it a little bit, but it's a product that I've been using successfully to remove like tough vintage stains. I've gotten stains out of so many garments and it is really easy to use. Their website is retroclean.com and you can buy a pound of it for $15 directly from the company, which I would suggest over ordering it through Amazon. It's the same price. Um, it says they're a family owned American company in Rancho Cucamonga. And the active ingredient is sodium perborate. It's like this powder that you just put in hot water and you let the clothes sit in the hot water. And in the summer, I'll do like a big bin outside and I'll put it in the sun and it will stay hot like all day long. So you got to stir it and, you know, keep an eye on it. It's kind of, I kind of always feel like I'm stirring a witch's brew when I go out to stir my big cauldron of stained garments with like a big stick. I have like a painter's stick that I stir it with or a broom handle to really give that full witchy effect. Um, anyway, so retro clean, use it, try it out. It's amazing. I love it. I've gotten so many stains out, which brings me to my most recent stain, a crotch stain that I encountered. So our shop gets a lot of donations and that is amazing because things just keep coming to us now. We've been in business for about three years. So people around here kind of know who we are and, you know, if, if someone dies, they will ask us if we would like their stuff. And usually the answer is yes. It can be dicey when you receive a large donation because you don't know what you're getting. So I received a large donation and... It was in trash bags, which is normal. And I don't think the person who donated their, I think it was their grandmother-in-law who died. Um, I don't think they'd really looked through the bag. So I'm used to this, you know, like I'm going through the bag. I'm pulling out some amazing things, you know, lots of 80s blouses and, you know, business b- business lady attire from like the 70s and 80s. And then I get to like the sweats collection and there's some amazing sweatshirts. And I don't know if you guys are on this tip, but I've noticed that sweatshirts are super hot right now. Like everybody's selling sweatshirts, vintage sweatshirts for like $100 or like $75 for just a sweatshirt. Um, and I pulled out this amazing Esprit sweatshirt that had like a couple paint splatters and I'm keeping that one. It's just too cool. Um, Then I pulled out this one that's got like this bunny rabbit from 1987 that says still cool after all these years. Um, I mean, it's just like a cool collection of a grandma who liked to be comfortable. Then I pull out these amazing sweatpants and they're gray, heather gray, they are a large size. The bottom had um, this little, 
like screen printed pastel flowers on it. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, I've never seen sweatpants like this. And these are so cool. And someone's going to want these because sweats are so hot right now. I don't know if it's quarantine or what, but sweats are in. Maybe they never went away. Anyway, I pull them up to admire their beauty. And right in the crotch, there's a very large blood stain. And I, to me, it looked fresh. Like it, it looked like someone had bled into these sweatpants and shoved them in a drawer and never washed them. It didn't look like blood that had been washed and wouldn't come out. It looked like blood that had been never washed. Um, again, I am in the business and the business of vintage. I am in the business of vintage and I'm used to stains. I don't, you know, I'm, I don't have a weak stomach for this kind of stuff, but there was something about this that just gave me this visceral reaction where I immediately had to fold them up and put them back in the bag and, I just had to put everything in the bag and close the bag up. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, I should be wearing, you know, a mask. Cause like, what if there's toxic anything in here and how long have these been sitting in this bag? And when did this person die? And like, you know, how old is this stuff? How, how old is this blood stain? Will this blood stain come out? Should I throw these in the trash can? But then of course I don't want to throw them in the trash can because I don't like to throw things away and imagine it just sitting in a landfill. So I'm in this catch 22 of, I can't open the bag, but I don't know what to do. So yes, I did stain treat them and I stain treated them really long. I stain treated them for like three days. I just kept stirring my witch's brew and then I washed them. And I think I, I think before I even like looked at them or touched them, I just went ahead and did another stain soak for a few days. And by the time five days had passed, I was over this visceral reaction I just kept imagining this person and maybe she was at the end of her life and maybe she had a medical condition and maybe it was embarrassing and maybe she couldn't deal with it. And it just really affected me. So anyway, the stain came out and you would never know, except that now I've told you and I probably won't be selling these. Um, I mean, I have them. I would honestly, I would wear them at this point because they're freaking cute, but, um, I will say the blood stain crotch area, it actually looks cleaner than the rest of the sweatpants. So I don't know what's up with that. But um, I just, I say all this because a lot of work goes into stain treating and cleaning and, you know, and I, I don't take for granted that this, these things that we sell were someone's life and someone who is special to someone. Um I get, I'm a little emotional talking about it just because I was very affected by this one experience. Um, I don't know what it means and I don't know what the future holds for this particular pair of sweatpants, but I was surprised at how affected I was. And, um, the moral of the story is retro clean works. (laughs) Thanks for listening and keep up the great work. I love listening to the podcast and I'm so thrilled to be part of the blog. Have a great day. Bye. Thank you, Lydia, for introducing us to the world of retro clean. I'm ordering some ASCP because I feel like I'm constantly putting things back at the thrift store because the stain seems unsalvageable, but you're, you're giving me some faith here. You know, It makes me sad that so many clothes get stained and people are afraid to take them home because they don't know how to fix them or they might not be fixable. Should we just normalize stained clothing? I mean, we all eat, we all drink coffee, we all have blood inside our bodies that sometimes comes out. Maybe we should just make stained clothes a thing. I used to think about that a lot when I was a kid because I was constantly staining my clothes. I was just a clumsy hot mess all the time. And it would make my mom so mad. I would wonder, what if we made stains stylish? Like I would I would literally sit around and think about this kind of stuff when I was a kid. And I imagined people buying brand new white sweatsuits and just like tossing spaghettios at them to get that like hot new stained look. Because you know people would do that if stains became a fashion statement, just like how 
periodically there'll be a trend of like clothes that have had fake like house paint applied to them to make it look like I don't know like you're an artist or something I'm not really sure I hate that that always makes me really mad too anyway thank you for calling Lydia I will share a link to retro clean in the show notes and please check out Lydia's column at clotheshorse.world and follow country feedback vintage and vinyl on Instagram So once again, I neither planned nor solicited any of these messages, but it's working out perfectly because Lydia mentioned how much she loved episode 39 with Jenny, aka the estate sale queen. Well, obviously Jenny is a very important part of the clothes horse community, and she's calling in today to tell you about her upcoming recurring column for clotheshorse.world. Hello, Close Course podcast listeners. This is Jenny. Some of you may know me from Late to the Party. Uh, I've also been on the pod a few times with Amanda talking about estate sales, thrifting, vintage fabrics, you know, all the good stuff. Um, so I wanted to take a minute uh, and just come on and just let everyone know I'm super excited about the blog launch. I think it looks awesome. Um, Close Horse World is going to be such a great uh, place for us to kind of gather virtually and share our stories and build our community, you know, share information um, and kind of be supportive of each other. Um, So I'm really into it. And I also wanted to let everyone know that I'm going to be doing a reoccurring column um, called Always Late to the Party. And it's basically going to be a deep dive into cultural nostalgia uh, and how it relates to sort of our visual inspiration. Um, I'll be exploring things like weird fashion trends, unexpected style icons, just basically digging around in the past for unusual um, visual inspiration uh, and kind of how it relates to us now in the modern world. Um, So this is something I do on a regular basis anyway, so I'm very excited to sort of share that with everybody. Um, Yeah, so that'll be coming out in March. And um, if you have any ideas or things you want me to chat about uh, or look into, feel free to uh, reach out. You can uh, connect with me through, you can DM me on Instagram at... um, late to the party people. Uh, and you can also email me at info at shop late to the party.com. So, um, very excited about this again, coming out in March and, um, big shout out to everyone who built the website and was a part of it. And of course to Amanda for, uh, creating this amazing community. Um, so yeah, I think it's going to be great. So, uh, I will see you guys on the internet. Do you have a suggestion for Jenny? Send it her way on Instagram at late to the party people. And if you've missed it, our executive editor, Carrie, actually did a really awesome meet the maker profile of Jenny last week. Even if you hate reading, which come on, you, you got to learn to love reading. But if you hate it, you should at least check out the profile just to see all of Jenny's amazing photos. They're so good. They're so colorful. They just make me so happy. I'll be having Jenny on the show every month so we can discuss her inspiration column. And I'm excited that I'm going to get to talk to Jenny more often. Okay, our next message is from Karen. And she wants to talk to us about free shipping. Hi, Amanda. This is Karen of Karen Kinney Studio calling in on one of the favorite topics here, free shipping. I got thinking more on this after listening to the most recent podcast episode. I know you have a lot of makers and small businesses listening out there. So I got to thinking what messaging could we use as makers to improve the free shipping messaging that goes out to our customers. A lot of makers, myself included, feel the need to include a free shipping model in order to stay competitive and meet customer demand and or to stay relevant on certain platforms such as Etsy. It's my understanding that studies have shown that most buyers actually prefer to spend more on an item if it has free shipping. Of course, as you mentioned, it's not free. That comes in somewhere. Uh, But the savvy business owner will factor that expense into their product pricing from the get-go. Whether or not the customer considers that is a whole other question. But I do wonder, what if we rephrase it in our language, in our shops, so that it might help to make it more aware to our customers that yes, shipping does still cost money, 
but small businesses are covering that expense as part of their service to you, the consumer. I'm thinking about going ahead and changing the messaging on my own web shop from, quote, free shipping to something more along the lines of shipping included as our gift to you, or we appreciate your business, so shipping is on us. I'd love to hear other thoughts on this, not only from the small business perspective, but also from the shoppers. Do you find it true that you're willing to pay a little bit more if the shipping is included? Thanks. Love what you're doing, Amanda. Keep it up. Talk soon. Bye. Thank you for calling, Karen. I, you know how I feel about shipping. I would love to hear what the rest of you think of Karen's idea of sort of killing the term free shipping, because I do think it implies that somehow shipping is free for the seller. I know that if you in any way work in any job that involves shipping stuff to customers, you know that's not true, but I do think it causes confusion just based on what I hear and stuff I see people posting online. I think Karen's idea is good because it very subtly says, hey, I'm giving you this shipping, but be aware that it costs money and it's just sort of an added treat that I'm giving you because we talked about this with Danny a while back. I don't think the customers understand that when you they ask for free shipping, what they're really asking you for is a discount. So I like sort of implying like, hey, rather than me giving you a 10% discount, I'm actually giving you some shipping, you know? So I know it's like potato, potato here, but I am all for anything that gets people to understand that shipping costs money. I've said it before and I'll say it again. Shipping is not free. You know, maybe it will be someday when we figure out how to teleport things, but that's not happening anytime soon. And we all know that somehow Amazon will cash in first. You can also find Karen on Instagram if you want to talk to her about this, you know, one-on-one at Karen Kinney Studio. And I'll include that in the show notes. Karen's also one of our Pegasus sponsors. So you can find that at the bottom of our show notes too. Okay, we have one more message, and it's from our friend Jem. You know her. You love her. Like most of us, the pandemic has certainly changed her life in a wide variety of ways. She's actually getting ready to pack up all of her worldly belongings and begin that hashtag van life. Hello, Amanda. Hello, Pony Posse. It's me, G Stroke Jem. I have been meaning to call since I listened to the Hotline episode recently where I can't remember everyone's name. I think it's Aaron is the librarian called and asked about the process of um, sort of distillation of personal style or discovery um, assembly of personal style. And then there was someone else and I'm sorry, I don't remember their name who was talking about the, um, the buy nothing groups and the, uh, like the barter system and how it can get into the sort of more intangible, like goods and services ends of things where, um, you're not necessarily giving money or an item of like commensurate value, um, to the other person, but you're actually, um, you know, like giving them some of your time for some other reason and that is also valuable of course the value of one's time and um what's funny about it is that just as that episode came out I was I am in the process of moving into a van and I would just say for the record that if anybody ever truly wishes to um become really immersed in the process of like the elements of their personal style i would recommend moving into a very small space um just because it truly limits the amount of stuff that you can have with you and it um, makes it much more apparent through the process of like scaling smaller and smaller and smaller until it can fit into like one small trunk or suitcase or a backpack like you know that sort of what we talked about before that like if you were a comic book character you know like what would be your where your your uniform basically um and i don't know like and then that that recording that i was originally going to make never happened because i fell into this k-hole where 
I lost my car key and it's the car that I was trying to sell. And so suddenly I had this car, which I had been hoping to get, you know, like a little bit of money for. I mean, it's a beater car, but I'd been hoping to get a little money for it. Um, went from being perhaps viable on Craigslist to sitting with a dead battery in my garage, inaccessible to, um, to the aid and the auspices of key repair because they couldn't program the key to the transponder without um, a working battery. And so just at that point, I got super frustrated. I took the replacement key and I did throw it like in frustration just at my bed. And I was just like, ah, I'm like wall after wall after wall. And um, each is like harder and rougher than the last. And I was thinking, man, like I've got this dead car. It's now essentially worthless. And so in a fit of um, humor (laughs) of some kind, I started the process of just getting someone to come and take it away for a charitable donation. And as I was doing that, I got a call from these sweet Armenian cats at the locksmiths. And the guy was like, you know what? Like, I really think we can do it. If you, if you want to call AAA, maybe they can come out and jump your car. And, you know, like you should just, just try. Like we think, we think it can be done. And it was really sweet because I just felt like these guys were sitting around at the locksmith shop being like, oh, that sucks. That girl came and just spent a hundred dollars on a replacement key. And now she can't pay the extra 60 to actually get the key to, um, switch on the ignition. And so I thought that was lovely. Cause like, it was this sort of, you know, altruistic shop <laughs> that didn't just say, oh, well, you know, that's that. Um, they really went the extra mile. So I was like, okay, last ditch. I'm, I'm just going to do it. I'm going to call AAA. I'm going to suck it up. So I called AAA and this guy came out and he was looking at the battery and um, he managed to kind of like smoosh the car, the car back, like push it back out of the garage without being able to put it in neutral. And as he was looking at it and he was like, oh yeah, it needs a new battery. And then I was like, yeah, yeah, I was really trying to sell it. And now I'm just, you know, kind of, um, over that. I don't even think it's possible. And then the more he started talking, the more I was like, is this guy going to buy my car? (laughs) And he fucking bought my car then and there after all that shit. And he just, um, he bought the new battery and then he just like handed me some cash and we made the arrangements to, uh, to go down the next day and like hand it over. And so the next morning I brought the locksmith back out and they made the key functional, put it in the ignition. Away I went. Car was sold for like a little money. But I think, you know, at that point I was, you know, just glad I wasn't totally losing money. I don't think I probably was. And then, um... And then a couple days later, I went to pick up my my van, the the one that I will soon be living in, from the shop. And I drove home, and I turned around, and there in the back of the van was my motherfucking key for the other car that I lost that started this whole um, sort of chain of events. And, uh, yeah, then I, I lost my phone charger, and on my way home from having to buy a new one at CVS... I happened past a a bit of a cat feature that someone had put out on the curb. It's kind of like a little um, wedge shape with a a little um, platform area at the top um, with carpet. And it so happened as I picked it up and decided to carry it home that there was this woman out front smoking and she was like, oh, great, I'm going to go back in and take that off Craigslist. I'm so happy that somebody was somebody's taking it. And then she was like, yeah, it was crazy. I got it built for my cat. It's getting kind of old. And then um, this girl came and got it from Craigslist like a year ago. And then somehow after a year, it just came back around to me. And she's like, and, and now it's yours. And I was like, yeah, sweet. Um, and then I got home and I really I had to take the carpet off because it is, uh, you know, smells like the other cat, so it's not going to work. And um, then I remembered that my father is a carpet salesman, so I thought to myself, I wonder if he could send me some carpet samples that I can use to upholster this cat feature for my van. And so I texted him and I was like, oh, if you have wool, that would be so amazing. The cats love wool. And then he sent me a message this morning that he picked out some Axminster samples 
which I just think is kind of like a nice um, button on the story and call back to our work with the royal family because Axminster are the purveyors, um, I believe by appointment, of carpet to Buckingham Palace. So, you know, I will soon be basically rolling around the U.S. in a Chevy Astro that, in, by all metrics of carpet, is the equal to Buckingham Palace. Da, 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 da. I told Jem that I was so glad that she called to tell us the miserable saga of the car key because we've all had terrible days like that. But I kind of feel like we never talk about it. Like it's almost like when the day is over, we just forget it. Or maybe it's embarrassing to be stressed out and miserable, even though, like I said, We've all had the day where we've lost our phone, we left our debit card in the machine, whatever. Sometimes life just sucks, right? It's not embarrassing to have a bad day or lose something or have all of the bad things happen at once. And I would almost rather see someone on Instagram telling this story that Jem just told us than showing their newest outfit at happy hour or influencers traveling all over the world during a pandemic. I hate that social media perpetuates this idea that somehow everybody else is having a dream life but you. No one else has ever been unable to get a key made for their car because the battery's dead. Nah, this happens all the time or AAA wouldn't exist. Can we just normalize honesty and real life? Ugh. If If we could come out of the pandemic with that accomplishment under our belts, imagine how amazing our lives would be. Also, that's a phrase right there, normalize real life. <laughs> also, I just wanted to add that Gem references our Patreon exclusive episode about the royal family and all of their merch. It's available to anyone who signs up for Patreon at any level. It's a laugh riot. Uh, it's also sad and funny and educational. It's everything. Um, and you'll also be treated to an extended version of her haunting rendition of God Save the Queen, which she ended her message with here. I just want to know, why hasn't Jem received a record deal for that yet? Because isn't that the song you want your baby to fall asleep to? <laughs> As Jem hits the road in the next couple of weeks, she'll be checking in with us to share her experiences and musings. I can't wait. And next month, she'll be back with an interview with her legendarily stylish dad. Seriously, this guy is a legend in our friend group for his nonstop dandyisms. I can't wait for you to meet him. If you have something to share, a random thought, a question, a reaction to what we are discussing here, please call the Close Horse Hotline, 717-925-7417. And I just wanted to add that all of today's phone calls were actually audio files that everyone recorded on their phones and computers and then emailed to me at amanda at closehorse.world. So that's an option too, especially if you're what I like to call a long talker. I get so excited when I hear from all of you, so keep it up. All right. Well, once again, totally did not plan this, but Jem's van story is an amazing transition into my conversation with Sophie of Ooey Gooey Van Shop. So let's get into that. Today I'm being joined by Sophie, who, I mean, she has such a story to tell, I don't even want to spoil it. So Sophie, why don't you introduce yourself? Oh, you're so sweet. My name is <laughs> Sophie Pokish, and I live in Northern California. I'm a 25-year-old gal who has started Ooey Gooey Van Shop, and I'm so excited to share all my stories with everyone. I know. I mean, I when you reached out and we started talking, I was like, oh my gosh, like I want everybody to hear all about Sophie's journey because, you know, one thing that I, I've been thinking about a lot lately and that I want to, con you know, continue to explore, like using the blog and the podcast is kind of how 
you know, the pandemic has changed all of our lives and a lot of us have experienced some bad things, right? But Mm -hmm. also there's sort of this like birth of a new a new movement, a new industry, all these new like business people. I hate saying the word entrepreneur because I think that word has gotten ruined by like startup culture and like, uh-huh. you know, like girl boss stuff. So I don't want to use that word. Uh, also, it's like hard to pronounce sometimes, but it is. <laughs> it is so amazing because in so many ways, you sort of embody all the ideals of Clothes Horse and what our community stands for. But you also have this added layer of totally being forced by the pandemic to turn your life upside down, literally so true. move to a different, move to a different hemisphere yes. of the world. It's so true. Uh, and, and you're kind of, you're making it happen. So, you know, why don't you just, you know, just start telling get us into it. what you yeah. Yeah. Let's just yes. get into it. <laughs> so I always, I always tell people that ooey gooey is 90% the universe and 10% me running to keep up with it. And I just think that totally embodies what has happened like in the last year or two for me, it's just been like this really wild ride. Um, And I will just preface saying, like, I grew up like a little girl who loved shopping. Like, I was such a clothes horse, and I still am. Like, (laughs) I have a huge rack of clothes next to me of just, like, my grandma has given me. I've thrifted, like, all these different things. And I would, like, line up my Polly Pockets, and I would line up their clothes so they could go shopping at the (laughs) mall, which I just thought was so funny. And, like, My first job, like when I was a little girl, I was like, I'm going to be a clothing designer and I would draw draw all these little outfits, but I never like throughout the years, I got so far away from that. I was like, oh, I could never do that. Like, I'm not a professional minded person. I like to play in the dirt and be outside. And yeah, so basically my story, the ooey gooey story begins in Australia and, uh, I moved to Australia in October of 2018. I had just graduated college the spring before, and I'd studied environmental studies and sociology. So in college, I really found that like my passion was outdoor guiding. I worked at the outdoor program at Whitman College and environmental science and talking to people about how we connect to our environments and how they affect us also. Um, so I knew my future was spent, was going to be spent working with our world instead of against it. And it's just such a beautiful intersection mm-hmm. between the clothing and like this kind of environmental science background I have. And it's just amazing. But I moved to Australia. I just wanted to be in the sunshine and learn how to surf. I uh, kind of grew up body surfing in the ocean and feel really connected to it, but wanted to get a board under me and kind of uh, get into this kind of uh, relaxed Australian lifestyle and be loosey goosey for a while. So I flew over to Melbourne to, with some family friends there and stayed with them in such a beautiful city, but I knew I wanted to be by the beach. So pretty much immediately flew up to Byron and saw everyone uh, was living out of cars and vans. So I was like, oh, maybe I should do this. And I had some money saved up. So I bought a Nissan Pathfinder on Facebook Marketplace and it had a bed in the back. And I just started coasting um, around and kind of doing these random jobs and saving money a bit and just meeting the most beautiful souls like all over and just having all these just like little funny happenings. And it was such such a beautiful time. But I um, bought the Pathfinder because it had four-wheel drive. And I knew I wanted to drive across the desert. Like I just had this image of me in the desert out <laughs> there kind of going on this journey. You know what I mean? And uh-huh. Uh, uh-huh. also like being in Australia, I just like kind of had a huge spiritual journey myself. Like I grew up very Catholic and um, definitely in this culture of going to mass and just being in Australia and like living very simply. I just kind of like my world was a bit more opened up to how I wanted to live. And uh, yeah, that was just like a huge part of my journey that also has led to me finding gooey gooey. But I was driving thousands of miles across the Australian bush with um, a beautiful friend named Tess from Brisbane to Broome. And I was just sleeping Mm -hmm. in the back of this Pathfinder and 
really only living with the clothes I could have in my trunk with my water jug. And we were just sleeping on the side of the highway in the, in the car. And I was just really, you know, reflecting on my path and how it was impacting the earth and all these beautiful places that I was just passing through, but in the same, like felt really connected to. So Mm -hmm. I started to think about um, fashion and sustainable fashion. And I had been thrifting for a while um, throughout college and everything had kind of moved my shopping (laughs) to the thrift stores. And I knew that shopping secondhand was a really easy way to try new styles. I am a person who just loves change. Like I change my outfit at least three times a day just because like I <laughs> always want to be comfortable. So I'm, and I'm always like doing different things throughout the day. So I'm like, oh, I'm going to go like to the garden. I need to change. Oh, I need to go hula hoop. I need to change new outfit. So I just love this like constant change. And like, you can't have be buying all these new clothes and spending all this money. So the thrift stores was kind of my place that I was finding Mm -hmm. my style. So I was driving across the desert thinking about this. I arrived in Broome in Western Australia, and I started to um, work at a pearl showroom. So I was a tour guide Um, But I was also in sales um, and I was wearing heels. I was wearing a dress and um, I was living in this sort of like (laughs) hippie camp. So like dirt on the ground. I was sleeping in the Pathfinder. It was just like such a funny dichotomy. And all my friends at the camp would be like, oh, you're so lucky. You get to go be in air conditioning and selling (laughs) pearls. And it was so fun. They would they would come on my tours and everything. And It was just so interesting to me because I'd never done sales before. um, And I just found I had, I loved it. Like I loved talking to new people. I loved making those connections. And um, I think I totally get that from my dad because he sells trees and like we have a family, family business that's a tree nursery. And like, he just has this gift of the gab that Mm -hmm. I'm just so happy that like he has shared with me. (laughs) So I was seeing like all my friends in the in the camp called Mango Camp in Broome, just like being so creative, so many different creative souls and, you know, having these parties on the beach and just kind of having this huge community of just like really um, support and love. And I was getting this idea like of a van shop. I knew I had so many friends in Australia who were living in vans and I knew I was going to be moving to New Zealand pretty soon um, because most people who are traveling, um, they do a year in Australia and a year in New Zealand. So I'd heard so many stories about New Zealand. I was like, I have to go. I'm so close. I'm not doing anything else. So I was getting ready to move to New Zealand. And um, when I got there, I bought a van um, and just started to travel and started to collect pieces. I kind of uh found a town called Raglan that I liked and uh, it's a pretty big surfing town so I was just trying to surf thrift as much as possible and I had two waitress jobs I was sleeping behind uh the pizza shop I worked at and I was just thrifting and kind of saving up to um kind of just be able to sell the clothes at markets and festivals So in January of last year, just over a year ago, I quit both my waitressing jobs in Raglan and just kind of started out on the tour. And I just uh, got gazebos. I like rented gazebos at each new uh, city location I was in. And I would attend the festivals, attend the markets. And I always had such beautiful friends helping me along the way as well. But I would just meet all these different people from all walks of life. And they would end up sitting in the ooey gooey stall with me all day. And it would just be so beautiful. And we'd be on the dance floor and I'd see all these pieces that like had sold throughout the day. And and just to see this community kind of come alive and people feel like ooey gooey was a safe space for them and like these festivals and yeah it was just I was super proud of it and I kind of knew in my heart that I wasn't going to ever let this go I was going to try to hold it as close as possible 
And then I had like a really fun like couple months, but then I was hearing rumblings of the pandemic coming <laughs> and I had, I was talking to my family in California. So I was like informed about what was going on, but it hadn't caught up to New Zealand. Yeah. It was pretty much one of the mm-hmm. last places. Mm-hmm. And um, so I was on the North Island and I I wanted to go down to the South Island. It's just a bit um, more nature, a bit quieter, less tourists. So I road tripped down there and um, reached out to a family who also works with pearls and they live on an island. So I went and worked um, on the island. I ended up selling my van and I knew that this was just the time to kind of reconnect to myself. Mm-hmm. And um, I knew it, it was just a break for Ui Gooey. Like I had, I knew it was going to come back and be more alive after, but it was just a break. And I was um, herding sheep and I was <laughs> um, feeding the animals and helping them grow power um, and growing these pearls. And yeah, it was a very interesting time being out there kind of on my own with this family, but they were so supportive and kind. And I was able to make money during this time, which was so mm-hmm. huge. Cause like, then I was able to bring home, um, some money with me. So in May, I got home just in May. Yeah. Of 2020. And I kind of just hung out with my family for the first couple months. I, I was really missing. I wasn't, I was pretty, yeah, I was missing them. I wasn't super homesick. I was pretty good um, away, but they're just such a good support system for me. So I just kind of uh, did some little trips around Northern California with them, but was really just staying home and um, enjoying the summer here. And I got to spend some time with my grandma and she's always been a really like avid quilter. So she mm-hmm. has a huge dedicated sewing room that has kind of gone unused the last couple of years um, as her health has deteriorated. And so I was talking to my grandma and kind of like, oh, I think I I was still selling uh, used clothes on Depop um, and kind of had just started Depop, but wasn't totally vibing with it. Like it was just so much photography and so much of me modeling, which I don't necessarily love. Um, so I wanted to <laughs> kind of move into my own vibe, if you know what I yeah, mean. Yeah, yeah, totally. And I didn't want to go into the thrift stores. Like, it's pretty bad in my county. So I was just like, uh, didn't really want to put myself out there, like, you know, have any added risks for anyone else. So right. I was talking to my grandma about sewing and she was like, yeah, you can have my old sewing machine. And then I just like got to it. It was just like, I swear the universe just helped me out so much. Like I got to the sewing machine and like made one shirt and then I was like, okay, I can do this. And I knew I wanted to make some flares. Cause like that was totally the style that inspired me in Australia. And a lot of my friends are wearing flares. I was like, these are so cute. I need to like bring these back, this idea and this energy with me. So I made a pair of flares and a little top and I posted it on my um, Instagram and like immediately got a lot of responses that people were like, I would buy this. And I was like, oh my gosh, wait, really? You would? <laughs> Which is so <laughs> funny. And so then I like had five orders the first week and then I had 10 and then I had 15 and I was like kind of getting a bit overwhelmed, but I was just like, oh my gosh, thank you. This is amazing. And, um, was really just learning how to like, sew and the basics and my friends were being just so kind and being like, oh, maybe fix this here, take this in a bit here, change this shape. And it's really just, um, it's just been such a beautiful, like progression, of events. And I like made my website in November and it was just in time for like the Christmas season and had a really good season, but yeah, I'm just really like grateful for all the journeys and like, it's brought me right to this moment right now. And I'm so excited to see where it keeps going. That's amazing. So I know that you, you use a signature fabric, right? Uh, I do. The bamboo uh, velour. So why don't you tell us a little bit, like, why is that your signature fabric? Oh, great question. I'm surrounded by um, this fabric right now. <laughs> I it bet. <laughs> is on my table. It is on my body. It is below my feet. Um, 
my room has been taken over by bamboo velour, which I am not mad about. <laughs> but I knew I needed a fabric that was a bit thicker just because I wanted like the flares to really like hold their shape mm-hmm. pretty well. And I'm still working on that. Um, but I also wanted something that's super soft uh, just because like ooey gooey really implies comfort to me. Mm-hmm. And like I said before, I'm someone who just needs to be comfortable to feel confident. Um, so I wanted it to be kind of that comfort. And also I wanted it to be, to have a bit of a like natural aspect to it and not be derived from fossil fuels. I just wanted to start out kind of trying a fabric that was representative of ooey gooey. And I'm still working on that. I'm learning more like every day about different fabrics but yeah, bamboo velour it definitely has pros and cons. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'm really happy with it right now. And and it has so many different colors. And I buy it from uh, like a family in the States and I've talked to them. Um, but the bamboo velour, it's so interesting because it has this shine that like it really changes colors when you move with it. And in the sun, it really changes. So I just really love like how it looks and also how it feels and you can wash it really easily and it dries beautifully and um, people actually use it um, for diapers. Interesting. Like for homemade diapers because it's really, yes, it's like really, um, what's the word? Absorbent? Yes, absorbent. Wow. It's really absorbent. That it's makes sense to me because, like, you know, it is bamboo, yes. which can be absorbent and is used in a lot of different – it's used in a lot more products than you would think because, like, a lot of wood and plant-type uh, fibers, it's very absorbent. But – I'm and that's a good thing to talk about, like, with bamboo velour. It's, like, all fabrics made out of bamboo are – they're natural, which means they're biodegradable, but they're mm-hmm. actually – it's like hard to say that they're natural either because exactly. they are man-made. It's like this uh-huh. weird middle ground, you know, where know. it's like made by humans but also not plastic. So, I mean, that's amazing. You know, that's definitely an improvement. I um, know. But, of course, as we talk about all the time, there are no fabrics that let you buy all the clothes you want all the time and not, you know, care for them and, you know, throw them out. Exactly. There's always going to be cons and – like, it's just about, like, for me, like, I just want to keep improving each fabric I choose. Yeah. You know what yeah. I mean? I mean, and, and like, I just want it to keep getting more sustainable. And the bamboo velour is just the beginning for me. Yeah. And I think it's a really incredible place to start. I mean, you're not using poly. There are more bad fabrics than good fabrics. So you're already off to a great start. And exactly. the bamboo velour is like such a nice fabric. You're like a person who now is like a business owner. <laughs> After all of this. I know. It's scary. I know. It is, it is kind of, it's so exciting though, right? I mean, and to like in a time. It is exciting. In a time when like so many other businesses that w- we know are, you know, we're not doing things the right way and, you know, we're kind of hanging on by a thread anyway because of that. Yeah. To see them go away and then like slowly start to see all of these small businesses coming up in, in all this chaos. I mean, that is so exciting. It's like a rebirth, you know? Uh it really is. I've been so excited to just like join this small business like community and just see like I mean once I like started following Clothes Horse and like finding all the other little brands it's just it's such a community and it's so beautiful to like see them just keep popping up and it's, having all these different people to like learn from. It's really exciting and I feel like it's like a community of people who are actually like helping one another out by being like, hey, have you tried yes. this? And this is what I did. And I really love that because it's not like you see like, I I don't know, like American Eagle asking Gap for advice. You know what I mean? Oh my gosh, so true. <laughs> That's so funny. What I like also love about it is like just like listening to Close Horse and everything. It's just that um, all these small businesses, like we're not competing with each other. Yeah. We're, you know, we exactly. all should be working together. It's like the real like competition, even if there is one, is with these 
big corporations like Gap and like American Eagle. And like, there's so much space for the small little businesses. Like we all are, I mean, we're all trying to do unique things and like put out just our true creative souls out there. And if like, I think they all just like work together so well when they're all genuine and it's, it's so beautiful to see. It is. I'm just, I'm just so excited to keep going. So, well, like, what are your dreams? What, what do you want to make Ooh. happen? Good question. Well, my dream is to move back to Australia. So I'm 25 right now. I would really, really love to, you know, be kind of settled in Australia by the time I'm 30. And I know that's kind of a big, a big <laughs> step. Um, and my my family and my friends, I've been like slowly like introducing the idea to them. Like, <laughs> just like oh, I might want to go back. And oh, I, I think I'm going to go back. And like when I was leaving to go traveling, I was like, I really want to fall in love with it. Like, I really hope I fall in love with uh-huh. it. And then when I got there, I was just so blown away by like my heart just like bursting open and just like seeing these places that I was, I was just so amazed that they existed and these communities that were just so loving and just so much like closely connected to their environments. And um, yeah, also just the fashion scene in Australia is amazing. Like there are so many small sustainable brands there that I saw that I was so inspired by. Well, and I think that's, that's really interesting. You and I were talking about this when we were planning this episode. Like, mm-hmm. why why is the Australian fashion scene so cool? Because it's been happening for a, a while. You know, back when I was at yes. Gal, like we looked to Australia and the brands there to really be the trendsetters. So Yeah, and I think it's just because like these huge fast fashion corporations like like Zara and H&M, they arrived to the Australian scene a lot later. So the Australian fashion scene just had kind of time to like, to grow and be like, grow all these smaller brands that, and also the lifestyle of Australia is so motivated by this like healthy living Mm -hmm. um, sort of energy and like eating really good food and drinking a really good drink. And maybe kind of that led them to, you know, question whether their clothes were healthy, you know, and uh, felt good on their bodies and represented representative of the Australian lifestyle. It, um, yeah, it's it's so it's so interesting. And you pointed out too that young people there they have more money. Oh my gosh, it's it was so interesting to see like I was like becoming friends with like these young Australian people who were like 18 or 19 uh-huh. and they like were like buying um, boats and buying vans. And I was like, how are you doing yeah. this? And it's just because the minimum wage is so high. Um, and like there, I was able to make so much money. Them, I was making like at least $20 an hour. And it was like sometimes like 23. Wow. And people just who are young who are, and also a lot of people aren't going to college. They're just working and, you know, living. So people are buying houses when they're like 22 and they're just kind of set. Well, and also, do you like, so, do you like people yeah. go into major debt to go to school there? Yeah, I know. That's the thing. They don't. Yeah, exactly. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, thank you. It's, oh my gosh. I mean, it's, it's like really shows like, how because there's like so I don't know I I get really riled up about some of this stuff sometimes because there's this really I do too old timey belief that if you like raise the minimum wage then all the businesses are going to go out of business and people won't have jobs and actually neither of those things are true because when you give people more money they can spend more money and businesses actually thrive and the whole the whole thing like the burden of higher education and student loans in the United States is it's it's really stifling creativity it is. don't you and innovation because like it stifles creativity so much amanda you're so right i just feel like it's like only then people who come from generational wealth whose parents you know paid to put them through school or who you know I, they are the ones they're the only ones then who get the opportunity to maybe be i hate this word but entrepreneurs and like do their own thing yes. or pursue their creativity while everyone else is like how am i going to pay rent and my student loans i'm definitely not going to also start my own business or make a lot of art I know. and i i i feel like it just holds back i mean i'm you know what like 
I have been one of those people, you know, like I definitely, mm-hmm. I would have friends being like, why don't you start your own business? And I'd be like, how, how would I do that? All my money goes on student loans, you know? <laughs> and all my time is spent at my job. Yeah, exactly. Trying to make money exactly. to pay off my loans. Exactly. And like the number of people I know who work like three jobs, you know, like just because they have I know. to pay off I, I know. I know. I mean, I think that that is, that is such a huge driver. And then you think about all these young people even being like, hey, I don't need to go to college to be creative or start a business or pursue my dream. I think that's also really interesting too, because we don't offer that path to people here. We're like, oh, well, if you don't go to college, good luck at your minimum wage job. Oh, but also if you do go to college, good luck at your minimum wage job. <laughs> it's just- I know. It's so sad here in the States how like the culture is just like, you're not successful if you don't go to college. You're not going to get the highest paying job if you don't go. Like it's so, uh, it's just, it's so stifling and like you need time you just need time to be creative, you know, Mm -hmm. like you need time to be alone. You need time to be able to like mess up. And it's, it really, and it just pushes things later in your life as well. Like, I just feel like, like during college and like, even like in high school, like I just felt this, I felt like I was a creative person, but I wasn't creating anything. Yeah. So I was, I was questioning that and I was like, I I just have to keep waiting. Like I just have to, I just have to kind of wait for the process to take me where it's going to. And I mean, it has, but it definitely took longer because I, I went down the more traditional path of going to college and, and then traveling and then kind of finding what I, what I wanted. But, um, and I mean, I'm glad, like I have like my whole environmental studies background, but it definitely, like, I think I would have found Ui Gooey a bit earlier if, if I hadn't gone to college. Yeah. And that's, that's so interesting to me. Yeah, it is because it seems like really what, I don't know, like what changed you and inspired you know. was going to Australia. <laughs> It was. It's so crazy. <laughs> so I I hear that you have some Australian listeners. Yeah, I know. That's why I'm like, we got to talk about That's amazing. How, how great Australia is because... Hello, everyone <laughs> in Australia. Tell me if you want to sponsor me <laughs> or marry me. That's fine, too. That, or that, too, yeah. Or just, like, host yeah. me so I can come for a visit. Totally. Um, <laughs> you know, I think there is, you know, obviously there are a lot of different sort of like elements that are or factors, I guess, that are making Australia this like incubator for all those exciting ideas, you know, s- specifically mm-hmm. in fashion, but also, I mean, in so many ways, right? It's not take yourself out of like clothing and there's still so many other cool ideas and music and art coming out of Australia. But I also think it's that Australia has always been like so far away from the rest of the sort of like Western countries that it hasn't been overrun in the same way by like multinational chains. You know what I mean? It's, yeah, like, exactly. Like Zara and H&M came there a lot later in the game. And like, I am assuming there's no Forever 21 in Australia, but I could be wrong on that. I have to look yeah. that up. But I think, I, I mean, I know they have their own internal sort of fast fashion chains that are now spreading to the United States, like um, Princess Polly. You know, it's fast fashion, so I'm not yes. like, everybody should buy Princess Polly, but it <laughs> seems like they have their, they have like a much more like self-inclusive kind of industry there where there aren't yes. as many other brands coming in there. And like, I have a really hard time imagining a lot of people in Australia walking around in like Gap or J Crew. Totally. You know what I they mean? T- they so have this like individualistic, like startup energy there that I think like it doesn't scare people to try to start things because they're so, they're not like, they weren't raised with like these huge corporations, like, you know, shoving like shirts down their necks, you know, stuff like this. Yeah. So they're just yeah. like, I they mean, have this energy that's like not like kind of tainted by all these big corporations. You know, and I've seen, you know, I've, I've traveled a lot, but I've never been to Australia. But one thing I've noticed when I've traveled to other countries is that they're often for certain subcultures of people are, there's like a romanticization of like American style and brands. Did yeah. you see that kind of stuff in Australia? It's definitely 
like I would say the surf brands are very like huge there. Like all like I think Billabong started there, but like all the other like O'Neill and um like what are some other Roxy and all these like it's very like the surf culture just like totally permeates everything in Australia. Mm -hmm. And like, that's like the same as California, I think, but I just, I don't really know which one was first. Like I grew up in California. I grew up always thinking like, Oh, California is the OG surf culture. And like, (laughs) like all the rest of the world is just trying to copy it. But then when I went to Australia, I was like, no dude, Australia is OG surf culture and California copied Australia. So it's so interesting um, to like, like I want to think about that more and like talk to more Australians about that um, as well. Yeah. I mean, I would love to hear from other Australians about that because it's really interesting. Like aesthetically Australia and like Southern California are so similar. Like it's, it's yeah. really interesting. Like if you showed me a dress and you took the label out, it would be hard for me to tell mm-hmm. if it was like an Australian brand or one of the brands that's coming out of like Malibu or something. You know what I, I mean? Know. It would be, exactly. it would be really challenging. Like there's a lot of like, Oh, high vibes and stuff like that. And so I, true. I, I also know like there are a lot of brands like I'm specifically thinking of like the more boho style brands from Australia that are massively huge in Southern California, yes. like Spell, yes. you know, yes. as Spell, the dresses. Ah, oh, yeah, yeah. I have a couple. They're some of my favorites, and they are so popular around like LA that you are like, wait, is that an LA brand? No, it's all the way from Australia. I it's, know, but I think of them yeah. as like LA style, you know. <laughs> I know exactly. So, it's so interesting. It is interesting. So but also like with the romanticization of like um maybe like the California or like just like America, it it is so true. Like I just like so funny. Like some of my Australian friends, they'd be like, Wow, you sound like you're from the movies or stuff like this. Like <laughs> and also just like all the music there. Like, I mean, of course, like when you travel, you realize this, but like all the music is playing all over the world is just American music. And it's just like that. I was just kind of like, kind of blown away. By it that. is and weird, I, right? I mean, it's the same thing with movies yeah. too. I know with movies and all the, all this like cultural references. Yeah. I mean, so, we've, yeah, we've gotten really, odd. we've gotten really good at exporting our own like culture while, you know, yeah. totally co-opting everyone else's and not giving credit. So <laughs> true. Oh, <laughs> my God. Yeah. So, so like what, are the brands that really inspire you that you, you know, would like to be like, or they motivate you to do better? Oh yeah. Really good question. Um, I found a brand like relatively recently, maybe like in the last year, uh, and they're really popular, Mm -hmm. Lucy and Yak. Um, and they just, I really resonated with their story because they also started in a van (laughs) in New Zealand and, They were just, like, sewing tobacco pouches at the beach and, like, selling those. And they've, like, amassed a really huge following in, like, four years or something crazy. And they went and built their own factory in India and, like, routinely go to spend time with their tailors there. And I think they even have a factory now in the UK because they're they're from the UK, um, the founders. So, yeah, they inspire me. They're very transparent. Um, They have... uh, they produce a lot of new items um which is like i'm like wow how are you producing so many new mm-hmm. items there um but they have like a lot of workers for them now and they've just like really blown up uh, do you know lucy and yak yeah their prints are so cute they have oh like my gosh, I the know. cutest prints like just really nice color and i feel like they're almost like like a new zealand big bud press you know what i mean so true right yeah like the colors and like they have different they have a lot of these like overall midi dress things that I'm obsessed yes. with. But oh my gosh, you would look so cute in one of those. <laughs> but I am like, why doesn't Big Bud Press make these? I guess I'm just gonna get this. I know that one, right? Um, but yeah, yeah it's, it's 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 really cool and just like an explosion of color, and I, I just I love that. I think it's it's really really cool. Once again, it's like wow, it like some of these ideas are so like global but you don't realize it until you start seeing them like like okay it also is weird like 
big bed presses from Southern California. Yeah. You know, losing jackets from New Zealand. If they look like they're they from would be the best UK. friends. Oh, they're from the UK. They look like they yeah, would be they just best friends. started in New Zealand. They look like they would be best friends, you know? Don't they? <laughs> I know. I'm like, I want Ui Gui to be best friends with them too. <laughs> yeah, totally, totally. With time, with time. Well, and you know what else is really interesting to me about it is like we're talking about two brands that I feel like, I mean, I know a lot of people know Big Bud because we talk about it a yeah. lot. Here, but I, I know a lot of people also know Lucy and Yak or they wouldn't be able to make all that stuff. And obviously there's a huge market there and people love it. It's like weird that like no none of the like the big like mass brands have jumped on this aesthetic at all, which it's to so me, true. It just proves how foolish and up their own butts they are. You know? Yes, they're just watching like all the other huge corporations. They're not finding the sneaky little cool ones that are coming Even up. Even so. when we just talk about like color and fabrics and these kinds of silhouettes and Yes. Just like, like I, it's not even like it's 70s because I know that the big brands are trying to do 70s, but they do it in this different way. Yeah. I feel like it's very like comfort slash utilitarian, like every day, but with like really colorful energy. Yeah. And it's like positive Which I clothes love. or something. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Positive clothes. And it's not like I want like Urban Outfitters or Forever 21 or H&M to jump on this train, but – it's interesting that none of them have. <laughs> I know. And I'm like so happy about it. Yeah, me too. I'm it, like, it is, it, it is really good. Leave it alone. This is our thing, but it's just like, totally they, don't touch it. <laughs> yeah, don't touch it. Um, oh, and that's like what, like, that's like the energy of like ooey gooey. And it's just like that, like, flowy and like very, like, versatile. Like, I, like, when I was creating ooey gooey, I was like, I want the clothes to be able to transition from like, dancing like at a club like when that happens again (laughs) um, to like you know like literally like sleeping in it and that's like those are the clothes that like because when I was like living in the van and stuff I couldn't have that many clothes and Mm -hmm. I wanted clothes that were like that that I could so dress up so dress down and like we're gonna really last and also be like really unique like Mm -hmm. I love wearing my play suit around my like conservative town because it's like so funny like I'll be wearing like bright orchid play suit bamboo velour in the shopping like center or something and people will just be staring at me I'll just be like smiling behind my mask like hi (laughs) 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 it's so cute I mean I think you hit on something there that is really important is like the most sustainable wardrobe is going to be things that you can wear for lots of different Yes. situations but that doesn't mean they have to be boring you know they still can be yes. unique and special and I think I, know. I think a lot of I mean I mean and this is because you know until recently a lot of the most su- well-known sustainable brands out there were kind of like boring you know yeah like like earth tones and like yes and like just like t-shirts like you know what I mean yeah, it's like I know it's not what ooey gooey is like I don't want to make a t-shirt ever no, like, I think we're like good. You know on what I t-shirts. mean? Like yeah. maybe I'll do a hemp t-shirt in like three years, you know? But like <laughs> that's just not like I want like these signature pieces. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think that's what excites me about you and other people in the community who are making these like very unique, but also sustainable, but also like long lasting and also versatile clothes. Because I think in the past, I mean, just with fast fashion and everything else, we've been raised we've kind of, I don't know, it's not even like we've been raised to believe, but we just have come to believe that there has to be a specific outfit for everything. And it, and yes, it, so. it only can be used for that. And, oh and my if gosh. it's not, like, totally. it's, like, it's like a smock or something, you know? <laughs> so true. Like I was listening to your episode about like the work clothes and like the work uniform. And that's something that like, that's why I can't like work for <laughs> companies like that because I feel so stifled when I'm not able to wear bright colors. Like I don't feel like myself. I don't feel like I'm like representing who I am and like my values. So I'm happy I, know. I get to work from home in my play suits. <laughs> I mean, I definitely, I had, after Nasty Guy went out of business, I had a lot of different interviews because I really wanted to stay in LA. And I interviewed with some like really corporate places where you had to wear like business clothes and that yeah I would cry I was like how 
Oh my god! I really want this job because, like, I don't want to like tuck in my shirt and like I know. wear pantyhose and like oh my god, navy <laughs> pumps or something to work. Totally. And like, <laughs> just, like power to the people who vibe with those. Like, yeah. you know what I mean? Like, like these. Like, I love that energy too. Like, and I love having that energy for like an hour, mm-hmm. but then like I love going back. So like. Yeah, it's so cool. Like everyone has their own little unique thing going on. And yeah, yeah just, I'm hoping the people who are like following Uigui or finding Uigui, they like can really resonate with it. And like, if not, then that's fine too. Like, I hope you find another small brand that like you absolutely love and like is creating like a little bit like of sustainable clothes in, in your niche. Totally. And just most importantly, like, buying what feels the best for you. Like I, you know, like, like you were saying, some people, they feel really comfortable in like business Mm -hmm. clothes. Like that's when they're like their best self. And for me, that feels like I'm wearing someone else's clothes. So I'm like really uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And it's like, it's almost like distracting to a point where it affects my productivity, you know? Exactly. <laughs> I so know. I think, uh, I don't know. I, I like to think that this is going to be like the dawn of a new era where we start to sort of dismantle a lot of those systems that they just don't make any sense ultimately, you know? So yes. I, my hope is that if you, do, if you don't ever want to wear business clothes again, you don't have to. <laughs> well, we're doing it here at Close Horse Amanda. It's yeah. happening. The revolution has begun. Yeah, totally. Totally. Well, if you were going to like give some advice to listeners, like what would you say? Like if you, you know, because you, you've definitely made some like strong decisions. Like you just like went to Australia and lived in a van, which for a lot of people would be really intimidating, you know, mm-hmm. but it was an amazing decision for you that led you on this journey where you're like, you know, you're becoming like your dreams. You know what I mean? Oh, it's so true. I know. How? Thank you for that. And like, what I would say to people is like, exactly what you said, like I was led and like, I really like had to trust my intuition with these big decisions. And I'm still like working on like hearing those voices inside myself and like, and hearing these messages, like from the universe, basically. So and what I try to do is just like be really conscious of um, of these signs and of these feelings inside myself because your intuitions are always correct. Like mm-hmm. I have, and I have seen that so many times, even just like with ooey gooey, like when I make something, I'm like, oh, I feel like this is a little short. And then like, I'll still like, I'll maybe like send it to one of my friends and they'll be like, yeah, it's a little short. And I'm like, dang it. <laughs> like I should have just <laughs> trusted my intuition. Like so every time, like, and like, I also like always try to, I know you can't always do the hard thing, the hard challenging thing. Sometimes you want to do the easy thing, but it always works out when you do do the hard challenging thing. Like it's hard and it's scary, but then it's always so worth it. And like, just like really thinking about your dreams, writing them down and then like really visualizing them and then, you know, letting them happen to you and just being aware of it and being conscious of it. So yeah, that's kind of what I'm always working on. I mean, I think the scariest thing, you know, something I've talked to a lot of people about over the past year, because we've had so much time to reflect on kind of being our lives taking a direction that we didn't choose, right? Like we've kind of had like fate thrust upon us and how, I mean, I, I say this all the time to people, like for me, even though it's still really scary I uh, and I'm stressed out all the time about my future, I also am kind of like happy about it because I for years had been wanting to like break free from like my like fashion industry career and do something that was meaningful to me. But I was always so afraid of taking that step. So then like fate sort oh of forced gosh. me to. And it literally like gives me chills like hearing you say that because like and now you're a part you're like the leader of this huge like beautiful <laughs> like community who like really appreciates you so much and like we're all just like watching you and like supporting you so much and it's gonna like it's just gonna keep going like I really do see it as just like this really exciting thing and just everyone listening just like try to participate in any way that you can because 
like it takes all of us, you know, and we're going to get there and it's just going to, it's going to be a really cool journey. And I think, I I mean, there are days that are scarier than others. Um, But I think that like, you don't have to wait for things outside of your control to force you to make a change like I did, you know, or like even you, you know, it was like, okay, well now I can't do this and I'm going to do this. And that's great. Like other amazing things have come in my life because of that too, where like nothing that had anything to do with what Mm -hmm. I did. But I think that there's something about just saying like, Hey, this is a really scary transition, like something I, but it's something I've always dreamed of doing of like sort of suspending your fear and chasing after everywhere anyway, instead of just like putting it off and putting it off until you're backed into a corner and you have to pursue it. (laughs) But also at the same time, like, you know, really being true with yourself and saying, like, do I 100% know that this is what I want to do? Which was another sort of challenge that I was facing for a while. I was like, I don't really know exactly what it is that I want to do. And then when I didn't have anything to do, it kind of gave me the time to think about what I wanted to do, if that makes any sense. (laughs) Yes. Oh my gosh, I so understand. Like that's like with the future of Uigui. Like I want to like, like I want to visualize my life in how I want it, and then like grow Uigui like around that because I want to work with it like my whole life, and I want to I want it to be able to like just be sustainable mm-hmm. in my lifestyle. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So like I want I would like. I'm okay with it going slow and I'm okay with just like making mistakes and then like improving. And like, I, I think about this all the time, like, Oh, I want to live on a farm and do this. I'm like, Oh wait, no, maybe (laughs) it's just always changing. So I think like, yeah. And it's hard to think about the future right now, you know? Yeah. Yeah. No, I think it it is. It's like, I think it's important no matter what you're doing to always sit down and think about you know, like, let's touch base with myself and say, what's, what's important to me? What are all of my dream life situations? And like, start to craft your life around that. Cause I feel like so many of us are like, well, I have to live in this city because this is where my job is. And there's no other job. And if I did get a different job, I'd have to move. And then I'd miss my friends, blah, blah, blah. And like, you just, as a person who's lived all over the country in the past, like my whole adult life, I can tell you that you kind of just have to like roll with it sometimes and try new things, even though like starting yeah. over is always really difficult. I never like regret it. Um, mm-hmm. But when you have, when you're building your own business or whatever the thing is that you're doing right now, I think it's important to take time periodically to say like, you know, how do I feel like it's going? What have I learned? What do I want to do next? What do I need to do to get mm-hmm. there? I mean, I think it's easy when you have your own business to just get into survival mode. And so you're just like making stuff, selling it, making yes. stuff, selling oh my it, gosh, right? So true. Yes, I know. It's so true. And then like, that's been definitely like, I am noticing this cycle, like in myself of just being like, oh, like what, you know, like, or like, what should I be mm-hmm. posting today? Mm-hmm. Or like, what should I be like looking to, but then I like, I'll like go and like take a hike or something. And they'll be like, yeah, I don't need to post anything today. Like I just need to like think today and I just need to be not thinking about ooey gooey. I just need to be thinking about myself and what I want. And I think it definitely what you say, like that survival mode, like you kind of get addicted to that like cycle of like being productive and like, like producing things. And like, definitely, I think it's like really important for like, you know, entrepreneurs or like just anyone who is like a creative person to just like take the time and like, give yourself space to like, let it flow. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. I like that too. But some (laughs) other things I'm trying to manifest right now and I've like been looking and I'm really excited is I'm finally going to buy another van here in the States and I'm like looking for my dream van. So if anyone's selling any vans, hit me up. And also I'm looking to move back to the beach. So I'm going to 
Um, yeah, I don't know if I'm going to move to Santa Cruz or San Diego, but um, I'm really stoked of just like finding a community and hopefully like by, you know, late summer or, you know, the fall getting to like have, um, you know, meeting with people and like gathering and going to some festivals and some markets. Um, but I'm, and I'm really looking for a studio on the coast and thinking about living in a van and having a studio and just like getting back to the water and the surfing and all the good stuff. I mean, that sounds amazing. The beach is my favorite place. I know. So. Well, I can't wait to meet you in person, Amanda. Close horse meetup. Right. I, it's like, it's so fun. It's like, it feels like the end of the pandemic is like, tbd like what i know mean? it's definitely tbd right right so i like, <laughs> like every to- person who i hear who gets a vaccine i'm like yes <laughs> yeah exactly and i just try to like keep that faith that yes it's tbd but that doesn't mean it's never right and like finding that balance between exactly. like tempering yeah. my impatience with optimism and so yes i can't wait to go out and meet everybody because I feel like yes. I, we've all become friends, yet we've never known each other in real life. Whatever that even means, because this oh is real life, right? I know. I feel like the pandemic really has shown us yeah. that like our relationships and our connections with other people can exist like in this other life, I guess, if you will, but that is still our real life. And like, that's like totally the close horse community, like just like this online, like community that's so like alive and well, you know what I mean? Yeah. And like flourishing and just like supporting one another and like just motivating each other. And I can't wait. I mean, definitely like when I think about like what I want to happen next, I totally want to go on tour. I want to go meet everybody. Dustin and I talk about it all the time, like how we're going to do it. And uh, oh my gosh, I love that you're like getting the, yeah, getting the plans like rolling. You know what I mean? I mean, it's a long time off, right? And like people have to like want to come and see a podcast being recorded, which might not be like the most exciting, thrilling evening you can imagine. So anything sounds so good right now. <laughs> I would like go just like pay t- buy a ticket to go watch someone like make coffee right now. You know what I mean? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> if they let me talk to them. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, that's so funny. Well, I love that. It was so nice to talk to you today, Sophie. Oh my gosh. It was so nice to talk to you too, Amanda. And I will just tease my spring collection a little bit. Okay. I will say swimwear and I will say recyclable and I will say printed. That's exciting. I can't wait to see it. I'm really excited about it. Wow. I'm really excited to just hear the rest of your episodes and keep following along. Well, thank you. such Such a nice chat, Amanda. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Sophie, for dropping by to share your story. I'll share the link to Sophie's store, Ooey Gooey Van Shop, in the show notes. She's got some cute stuff on there. Go on and check it out. Uh, Sophie, could you please make some red velour stuff? I'm having like a red velour moment. And I mean that in like, in the way that like, I don't actually own anything red velour, but I really like the idea of swaddling myself in it. (laughs) I really want a red velour romper. I'm just saying, if you come across some red bamboo velour, holler at me. Um, I also have this fantasy that when Sophie tracks down her van and gets back on the road that she and Jem will become van buddies and travel all around the U.S. together. I would love to see that. (laughs) You know, just even saying that out loud is making me so sad and nostalgic for, you know, hanging out with friends. I can't wait to hug everyone and meet all of you IRL. You know, until then... We just got to keep being ourselves, hashtag normalizing real life, and, you know, just supporting one another the best way we can from afar. Thanks for listening to another episode of Close Horse. If you like what you're hearing, please, you know what I'm going to say, rate and review on Apple Podcasts and consider subscribing. Then you'll never miss an episode. And of course, tell your friends. 
Don't forget that you can find us on Instagram at Close Horse Podcast. There's always something going on there. And every Friday, I've been doing an Instagram Live at 8 p.m. Eastern Time, where I update you on some new blog stuff, answer your questions about this week's episodes, or really anything else. Uh, This week, let's see, we talked about thrifting. We talked about my Hello Kitty phone. We talked about unemployment, uh, minimum wage, um, contract work. Which I mean, guys, we went on a journey. Oh, yeah. And we talked about AIM names, too. As you can see, we've been having a pretty good time. So set a reminder to check it out next Friday night. And so set a reminder to check it out next Friday night. Also, if you want to meet other Close Horse listeners, join the Close Horsing Around Facebook group, and I'll share the link to that in the show notes. If you need a new podcast, which, I mean, there's like 10,000 podcasts, but maybe you need another one, check out my other show, The Department, which I co-host with my friend Kim. We're in the midst of this series about the 2000s, which much like the pandemic ends at point TBD because we just keep finding more stuff to talk about. Uh, And right now we're really into the hipsters. Last week we released an episode about the misogyny and scammery of the hipsters. And this week we will be releasing an episode about irony and some more scams. So check it out. I will share the link in the show notes. Thanks as always to Justin Travis White for our music and audio support. Bye.